So what's up, everybody? H. Dub here with Chapter 7 of Brave New World. Chapter 7. This one's a doozy. Uh, we get to see some of the, uh, the, the society, the culture of the people in the reservation. Uh, and um, we get a little bit of insight into some of the, the mystery and maybe some drama uh, that happens with uh, this guy named John that you're going to meet. Um, and his life and kind of his history. And it's a crucial kind of pivotal chapter. There are a couple of spots in here that are like big chunks of text. Right? Um, like long paragraphs. So um, if we get to one of those, there, there might be a, ch a time where I, I kind of stop, uh, just maybe take a break <laughs> uh, or catch my breath or uh, make a point. So um, so there's that. Just understand that, that there's going to be, you know, a couple of pretty good chunks in here. Uh, as always, uh, I try to keep the, the voices uh, sort of similar, um, but we'll see if, if that is possible um, when you extend this thing over the course of weeks. So anyway, without any further ado, here is chapter seven. The mesa was like a ship becalmed in a strait of lime-colored dust. The channel wound between precipitous banks and slanting from one wall to the other across the valley ran a streak of green, the river and its fields. On the prow of that stone ship in the center of the strait and seemingly a part of it, a shape and geometrical outcrop of the naked rock stood the Pueblo of Malpais, a block of Above block, each story smaller than the one below, the tall houses rose like stepped and amputated pyramids into the blue sky. At their feet lay a straggle of low buildings, a crisscross of walls, and on three sides the precipices fell sheer into the plain. A few columns of smoke mounted perpendicularly into the windless air and were lost. Queer, said Lenina, very queer. It was her ordinary word of condemnation. I don't like it, and I don't like that man. She pointed to the Indian guide who had been appointed to take them up to the Pueblo. Her feeling was evidently reciprocated. The very back of the man, as he walked along before them, was hostile, sullenly contemptuous. Besides, she lowered her voice, he smells. Bernard, Bernard did not attempt to deny it. They walked on. Suddenly it was as though the whole air had come alive and were pulsing, pulsing with the indefatigable movement of blood. Up there in Malpais, the drums were being beaten. Their feet fell in with the rhythm of that mysterious heart. They quickened their pace. Their path led them to the foot of the precipice. The sides of the great mesa ship towered over them, 300 feet into the gunwale. I wish we could have brought the plane, said Lenina, looking up resentfully at the blank of impending rock face. I hate walking, and you feel so small when you're on the ground at the bottom of a hill. They walked along for some way in the shadow of the mesa, rounded a projection, and there, in a water-worn ravine, was the way up to the companion, up the companion ladder. They climbed. It was a very steep and steep path that zigzagged from side to side of the gully. Sometimes the pulsing of the drums was all but inaudible. At others, they seemed to be beating only just round the corner. When they were halfway up, an eagle flew past so close to them that the wings, the wind of his wings, blew chill on their faces. In a crevice of the rock lay a pile of bones. It was all oppressively queer, and the Indians smelt stronger and stronger. They emerged at last from the ravine into the full sunlight. On top of the mesa was a flat deck of stone. Like the Charing Tea Tower, was Lenina's comment. But she was not allowed to enjoy her discovery of this reassuring resemblance for long. A padding of soft feet made them turn around. Naked from throat to navel, their dark brown bodies painted with white lines, like asphalt tennis courts, Lenina was later to explain. Their faces inhuman and with daubings of scarlet, black, and ochre, two Indians came running along the path. Their black hair was braided with fox fur and red flannel. Cloaks of turkey feathers fluttered from their shoulders. Huge feathers, diadems, exploded gaudily around their necks. Their heads, sorry. With every step they took came the clink and rattle of their silver bracelets, their heavy necklaces of bone and turquoise beads. They came on with, uh, without a word, running quietly in their deerskin moccasins. One of them was holding a feather brush. The other carried in either hand what looked like, at a distance, like three or four pieces of thick rope. One of the ropes writhed uneasily, and suddenly, Lenina saw that they were snakes. The men came nearer and nearer. Their dark eyes looked at her, but without giving any sign of recognition, any smallest sign that they had seen her or were aware of her existence. The writhing snake hung limp against, again with the rest. The men passed. I don't like it, said Lenina. I don't like it. She liked even less what awaited her at the entrance to the Pueblo, where their guide had left them while he went inside for instructions. 
the dirt to start with, the piles of rubbish, the dust, the dogs, the flies. Her face wrinkled up into a grimace of disgust. She held her handkerchief to her nose. But how can they live like this? She broke out in a voice of indignant incredulity. It wasn't possible. Bernard shrugged his shoulders philosophically. Anyhow, he said, they've been doing it for the last five or six thousand years, so I suppose they must be used to it by now. But cleanliness is next to fordliness, she insisted. Yes, and civilization is sterilization, Bernard went on, concluding on a tone of irony the second hypnopedic lesson in elementary hygiene. These people have never heard of our Ford, and they aren't civilized. So there's no point in... Oh! She gripped his arm. Look! An almost naked Indian was very slowly climbing down the ladder from the first floor of the terrace, first floor terrace of a neighboring house, rung after rung with the tremulous caution of extreme old age. His face was profoundly wrinkled and black, like a mask of obsidian. The toothless mouth had fallen in. At the corners of the lips, on each side of the chin, a few long bristles gleamed almost white against the dark skin. A long, umbraided hair hung down in gray wisps round his face. His body was bent and emaciated to the bone, almost fleshless. Very slowly he came down, pausing at each rung before he ventured another step. What's the matter with him? whispered Lenina. Her eyes were wide with horror and amazement. He's old, that's all, Bernard answered as carelessly as he could. He too was startled, but he made an effort to seem unmoved. Old? she repeated. But the director's old. Lots of people are old. They're not like that. That's because we don't allow them to be like that. We preserve them from diseases. We keep their internal secretions artificially balanced at a youthful equilibrium. We don't permit their magnesium-calcium ratio to fall below what it was at 30. We give them transfusion of young blood and keep their metabolism permanently stimulated, so of course they don't look like that. Partly, he added, because most of them die long before they reach this old creature's age. Youth almost unimpaired till 60, then crack, the end. But Lenina was not listening. She was watching the old man. Slowly, slowly he came down. His feet touched the ground. He turned. In their deep sunken orbits, his eyes were still extraordinarily bright. They looked at her for a long moment expressionlessly, expressionlessly, without surprise, as though she had not been there at all. Then slowly, with bent back, the old man hobbled past them and was gone. But it's terrible, Lilina whispered. It's awful. We ought not to have come here. She felt in her pocket for her soma, only to discover that by some unprecedented oversight she had left the bottle down in the rest house. Bernard's pockets were also empty. Lenina was left to face the horrors of Malpais unaided. They came crowding in on her thick and fast. The spectacle of two young women giving breast to their babies made her blush and turn away her face. She had never seen anything so indecent in her life. And what made it worse was that instead of tactfully ignoring it, Bernard proceeded to make open comments on this revoltingly viviparous scene. Ashamed, now that the effects of the soma had worn off, of the weakness he had displayed that morning in the hotel, he went out of his way to show himself strong and unorthodox. What a wonderfully intimate relationship, he said, deliberately outrageous. And what an intensity of feeling it must generate. I often think that one, that one may have missed something in not having had a mother. And perhaps you've missed something in not being a mother, Lumina. Imagine yourself sitting there with a little baby of your, of your own. Bernard, how can you? The passage of an old woman with ophthalmia. ophthalmia and a disease of the skin distracted her from the indignation. Let's go away, she begged. I don't like it. But at this moment, their guide came back and beckoned them to follow, led the way down to the narrow, down the narrow street between the houses. They rounded a corner. A dead dog was lying in a rubbish heap. A woman with a goiter was looking for lice in the hair of a small girl. Their guide halted at the foot of the ladder, raised his hand perpendicularly, then darted it horizontally forward. They did what he mutely commanded. Climbed the ladder and walked through the doorway, to which it gave access, into a long, narrow room, rather dark and smelly of smoke and cooked grease, and long-worn, long-unwashed clothes. At the further end of the room was another doorway, through which came a shaft of sunlight and the noise, very loud and close, of the drums. They stepped across the threshold and found themselves on a wide terrace, Below them, shut in by the tall houses, was the village square, crowded with Indians. Bright blankets and feathers and black hair and a glint of turquoise and dark skin shining with heat. Lenina put her handkerchief to her nose again. In the open space at the center of the square were two circular platforms of masonry and trampled clay. The roofs, it was evident, of underground chambers. For in the center of each platform was an open hatchway, the ladder emerging from the lower darkness. 
sound of subterranean flute playing came up and was almost lost in the steady, remorseless persistence of the drums. Lenina liked the drums. Shutting her eyes, she abandoned herself to their soft, repeated thunder, allowed it to invade her consciousness more and more completely, till at last there was nothing left in the world but that one deep pulse of sound. It reminded her reassuringly of the synthetic noises made at Solidarity Services and Ford's Day celebrations. Orgy porgy, orgy porgy, she whispered to herself. These drums beat out just the same rhythms. There was a sudden startling burst of singing, hundreds of male voices crying out fiercely in harsh metallic unison. A few long notes in silence, the thunderous silence of the drums, then shrill and a neighing treble the women's answer, then again the drums, and once more the men's deep savage affirmation of their manhood. Clear, yes, the place was clear, so was the music, so were the clothes and the goiters and the skin diseases and the old people, but the performance itself, there seemed to be nothing especially clear about that. It reminds me of a lower caste community sing, she told Bernard. So this next paragraph is uh, one of those long ones. Uh, you can see if I scroll down, this is going to take a while for me to get through. And this basically uh, describes a ritual that Bernard and Lenina are going to witness. And uh, it's a little bit graphic, but, you know, whatever. Um, fair warning. But a little later, it was reminding her a good deal less of that innocuous function. For suddenly, there had swarmed up from those round chambers underground a ghastly troop of monsters. Hideously masked, or painted out of all semblance of humanity, they had tramped out a strange limping dance round the square, round and round again, singing as they went round and round, each time a little faster, and the drums had changed and quickened their rhythm so that it became like the pulsing of fever in the ears, and the crowd had begun to sing with the dancers louder and louder, and first one woman had shrieked and then another and another, and though they were as though they were being killed. And then suddenly the leader of the dancers broke out of the line, ran to a big wooden chest which was standing at the end of the square, raised the lid, and pulled out a pair of black snakes. A great yell went up from the crowd, and all the other dancers ran towards him with outstretched hands. He tossed the snakes to the first comers, then dipped back into the chest for more. More and more, black snakes and brown and mottled, he flung them out. And then the dance began again on a different rhythm. Round and round they went with their snakes, snakily with a soft undulating movement at the knees and hips. Round and round, the leader gave a signal, and one after another, all the snakes were flung down in the middle of the square. An old man came up from underground and sprinkled them with a cornmeal, and from the other hatchway came a woman and sprinkled them with water from a black jar. Then the old man lifted his hand, and startlingly, terrifyingly, there was an absolute silence. The drums stopped beating. Life seemed to have come to an end. The old man pointed toward the two hatchways that gave entrance to the lower world, and slowly, raised by invisible hands from below, there emerged from the one a painted image of an eagle, and from the other that of a man naked and nailed to a cross. They hung there, seemingly self-sustained, as though watching. The old man clapped his hands. Naked but for a white cotton breech cloth, a boy of about eighteen stepped out of the crowd and stood before him. His hands crossed over his chest, his head bowed. The old man made the sign of the cross over him and turned away. Slowly the boy began to walk around the writhing heap of snakes. He had completed the first circuit and was halfway through the second when, from among the dancers, a tall man wearing a mask, the mask of a coyote, 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 uh, and holding in his hand a whip of plated leather advanced toward him. The boy moved on as though unaware of the other's existence. The coyote man raised his whip. There was a long moment of expectancy, then a swift movement, a whistle of the lash as and its loud, flat-sounding impact on the flesh. The boy's body quivered, but he made no sound. He walked on at the same slow, steady pace. The coyote struck again, again, and at every blow, and at first a gasp, and then a deep groan went round went up from the crowd. The boy walked twice, thrice, four times round he went. The blood was streaming five times round, six times round. Suddenly Lenina covered her face her face uh, with her hands and began to sob. Oh, stop them, stop them, she implored. But the whip fell and fell inexorably, seven times round. Then all at once the boy staggered and, still without a sound, pitched forward onto his face. Bending over him, the old man touched his back with a long white feather held up for a moment, crimson, for the people to see, then shook it thrice over the snakes. A few drops fell, and suddenly the drums broke out again into a panic of hurrying notes. There was a great shout. The dancers rushed forward, picked up the snakes, and ran out of the square. Men, women, children, all the crowd ran after them. A minute later, the square was empty. Only the boy remained, prone where he had fallen, quite still. Three old women came out of, the, out of one of the houses, and with some difficulty lifted him and carried him in. 
The eagle and the man on the cross kept guard for a little while over the empty pueblo. Then, as though they had seen enough, sank slowly down through their hatchways, out of sight, into the netherworld. Lenina was still sobbing. Too awful, she kept repeating, and all Bernard's consolations were in vain. Too awful, that blood, she shuddered. Oh, I wish I had my soma. There was the sound of feet in the inner room. Lenina did not move, but sat with her face in her hands, unseeing, apart. Only Bernard turned round. The dress of the young man who now stepped on out onto the terrace was Indian, but his plaited hair was straw-colored, his eyes a pale blue, and his skin a white skin, bronzed. Hello? Good morrow? said the stranger, in faultless but peculiar English. You're civilized, aren't you? You come from the other place, outside the reservation? Who on earth? began Bernard in astonishment. The young man sighed and shook his head. Most unhappy gentleman. And pointing to the blood stains in the center of the square. Do you see that damned spot? He asked in a voice that trembled with emotion. And oh, by the way, damned spot reference to Shakespeare uh, Macbeth. Out, out, damned spot uh, is what uh, Lady Macbeth says after she's uh, started to go insane. So just FYI. A gram is better than a dam, said Lenina mechanically from behind her hands. I wish I had my soma. I ought to have been there, the young man went on. Why wouldn't they let me be the sacrifice? I'd have gone around ten times, twelve, fifteen. Palawitya only got as far as seven. They could have had twice as much blood from me. Multitudinous seas incarnadine. He flung out his arms in a lavish gesture, then despairingly let them fall again. But they wouldn't let me. They disliked me for my complexion. It's always been like that. Always. Tears stood in the young man's eyes. He was ashamed and turned away. Astonishment made Lena forget the de deprivation of Soma. She uncovered her face and for the first time looked at the stranger. Do you mean to say that you wanted to be hit with that whip? Still averted from her, the young man made a sign of affirmation. For the sake of the Pueblo, to make the rain come and the corn grow, and to please Pukung and, and Jesus, and then to show that I can bear pain without crying, yes. And his voice suddenly took on a new resonance. He turned with a proud squaring of his shoulders, a proud, defiant lifting of the chin. Show that I'm a man. Oh. He gave a gasp and was silent, gaping. He had seen for the first time in his life the face of a girl whose cheeks were not the color of chocolate or dogskin, whose hair was auburn and permanently waved, whose expression, amazingly lovely, novel, amazing novelty, was one of benevolent interest. Lenina was smiling at him. Such a nice-looking boy, she was thinking, and a really beautiful boy body. The blood rushed up into the young man's face. He dropped his eyes, raised them again for a moment, only to find her still smiling at him, and was so much overcome that he had to turn away and pretend to be not looking, or to be looking very hard at something on the other side of the square. Bernard's questions made a diversion. Who? How? When? From where? Keeping his eyes fixed on Bernard's face, for so passionately did he long to see Lenina smiling, that he simply dared not look at her. The young man tried to explain himself. Linda and he, Linda was his mother, the word made Lenina look uncomfortable, were strangers in the reservation. Linda had come from the other place so long ago before he was born, with a man who was his father. Bernard pricked up his ears. She had gone walking alone in those mountains, over there to the north, had fallen down a steep place and hurt her head. Go on, go on, said Bernard excitedly. Some hunters from Malpais had found her and brought her to the Pueblo. As for the man who was his father, Linda had never seen him again. His name was Tomakin. Yes, Thomas was the DHC's first name. He must have flown away, back to the other place, a a away without her, a, a bad, unkind, natural man. And so, I was born in Malpais, he concluded. In Malpais. And he shook his head the squalor of that little house on the outskirts of the Pueblo. A space of dust and rubbish separated it from the village. Two famine-stricken dogs were nosing obscenely in the garbage at its door. Inside, when they entered, the twilight stank and was loud with flies. Linda, the young man called. From the inner room, a rather hoarse female voice said, Coming. They waited. In bowls on the floor were the remains of a meal, perhaps of several meals. The door opened. A very stout, blonde squaw stepped across the threshold and stood looking at the stranger staring incredulously, her mouth open. Lenina noticed with disgust that two of its front teeth were missing. 
and the color of the ones that remained, oof, she shuddered. It was worse than the old man, so fat, and all the lines in her face, the flabbiness, the wrinkles, and the sagging cheeks with those purplish blotches, and the red veins on her nose, the bloodshot eyes, and that, that neck, that neck, and the blanket she wore over her head, ragged and filthy, and under the brown sack-shaped tunic, those enormous breasts, the bulge of the stomach, the hips, oh, much worse than the old man, much worse. And suddenly the creature burst out in a torrent of speech, rushed at her with outstretched arms, and forward, forward, it was too revolting. In another moment, she'd be sick-pressed, she'd be sick, pressed her against the bulge, the bosom, and began to kiss her. Forward, to kiss, slobberingly, and smelt too horrible, obviously never had a bath, and simply reeked of that beastly stuff that was put into Delta and Epsilon bottles. No, it wasn't true. It wasn't true about Bernard. Positively stank of alcohol. She broke away as quickly as she could. A blubbered and distorted face confronted her. The creature was crying. Oh, my dear, my dear, the torrent of words flowed suddenly. If you knew how glad, after all these years, a civilized face, yes, a civilized clothes, because I thought I should never see a piece of real acetate silk again. She fingered the sleeve of Lenina's shirt. The nails were black. And those adorable viscose velveteen shorts. Do, do you know, dear, I've still got my old clothes, the ones I came in, put away in a box. I'll show them to you afterwards. Though, of course, the acetate has all gone into holes. But such a lovely white bandolier, though. I, I must say, your, your green Morocco is even lovelier. Not that it did me much good, that bandolier. Her tears, be, tears began to flow again. I suppose John told you what I had to suffer, and not a gram of soma to be had, only a drink of mescal every now and then, when Pope used to bring it. Pope is a boy, I used to know, but it makes you feel so bad afterwards. The mescal does, and, and you're sick with the peyote. Besides, it always made that awful feeling of being ashamed much worse the next day. And I was so ashamed. Just, just think of it. Me, a beta, having a baby. Put yourself in my place. The mere suggestion made Lenina shudder. Though it wasn't my fault, I swear, because I, I still don't know how it happened. Seeing that I did all the Malthusian drill, you know, by numbers, one, two, three, four, always, I swear it. But all the same, it happened. And, and of course, there wasn't anything like an abortion center here. Is it still down in Chelsea, by the way? She asked. Lenina nodded. And still floodlighted on Tuesdays and Fridays? Lenina nodded again. That lovely plink glass tower. Poor Linda lifted her face and with closed eyes ecstatically contemplated the bright remembrance of the image. And the river at night she whispered. Great tears oozed slowly from out. Great tears oozed slowly out from behind her tight shut eyelids. And flying back in the evening from Stoke Poges, and then a hot bath and vibro vacuum massage. But there, she drew a breath, shook her head, opened her eyes again, sniffed once or twice, then blew her nose on her fingers and wiped them on the skirt of her tunic. Oh, I'm so sorry, she said in response to Lenina's involuntary grimace and disgust. I oughtn't to have done that. I'm sorry. But what are you to do when there aren't any handkerchiefs? I, I remember how it used to upset me, all that dirt and nothing aseptic. I had an awful cut on my head when they first brought me here. You can't imagine what they used to put on it. Filth, just filth. Civilization is sterilization, I used to say to them. And streptococcus G to Banbury D T to, to see a fine bathroom and WC as though they were children. But of course they didn't understand. How, how should they? And in the end, I suppose I got used to it. And anyhow, how can you keep things clean when there isn't a hot water laid on? And look at these clothes. These beastly, this beastly wool isn't like acetate. It lasts and lasts, and you're supposed to mend it if it gets torn. But I'm a beta. I worked in the fertilizing room. Nobody ever taught me to do anything like that. It wasn't my business. Besides, it never used to be right to mend clothes. Throw them away when they've got holes in them. And buy new. The more stitches, the less riches. Isn't that right? Mending's antisocial, but it's all different here. It's, it's like living with lunatics. Everything they do is mad. She looked around, saw John and Bernard had left them and were walking up and down the, in the dust and garbage outside the house, but nonetheless confidently lowering her voice and leaning while and leaning while Anina stiffened and shrank, so close that the alone reek of embryo poison stirred and stirred the hair on her cheek. For instance, she hoarsely whispered, take the way they have one Another here. Mad, I tell you. Yeah, absolutely mad. Everyone belongs to everyone else, don't they? Don't they? She insisted, tugging at Lenina's sleeve. Lenina nodded, had averted her head, let out the breath she had been holding, and managed to draw another one relatively untainted. Well, there. Well, here, the other went on. Nobody's supposed to belong to more than one person. And if you have people in the ordinary way, the others think you're wicked and antisocial. They hate and despise you. Once, a lot of women came and made a scene because their men came to see me. Well, why not? And they rushed at me. No, it was too awful. I can't tell you about it. Linda covered her face with her hands and shuddered. 
they're so hateful, the women here, mad, mad and cruel. And of course, they don't know anything about Malthusian drill or bottles or decanting or anything of that sort. So, so they're having children all the time, like, like dogs. It's too revolting. And to think that I, oh, Ford, Ford, Ford. And yet John was a great comfort to me. I don't know what I should have done without him. Even though he did get upset whenever a man, quite as a tiny boy even, once, but that was when he was bigger, he, he tried to kill poor Waihusiwa, or was it Pope? Just because I used to have him sometimes. Because I never could make him understand that what civilized people do. Being mad's infectious, I believe. Anyhow, John seems to have caught it from the Indians. Because, of course, he was with them a lot. Even though they always were so beastly to him and wouldn't let him do all the things that the other boys did. Which was a good thing, in a way, because it made it easier for me to condition him a little. Though you've no idea how difficult that is. There's so much one doesn't know. It wasn't my business to know. I mean, when a child asks you how a helicopter works or, or who made the world, well, what, do you, what are you to answer if you're a beta? And I've always worked in the fertilizing room. What are you to answer? Okay, then. There we go. Did you guys make the connection there between with the director, uh, his story, right? And ha right before he got mad at, at Bernard. Remember that? Where he's like, yeah, I went there once. And then, uh, oh, the girl I went with, the, there she is. We just met her. Yay. Okay. See you next time for Chapter 8. Bye-bye.